We're going to continue on discussing the dermis and the hypodermis briefly, and then we're going to talk about some derivatives associated with the integument. Oh, sorry. I should talk about this really quick. So the dermis has two major regions. It has a papillary layer and then a reticular layer. The majority of the, the dermis is reticular layer. Um, the papillary region consists of areolar connective tissue, which makes up that um, basement membrane. It also helps in producing the, um, or it produces dermal papillae, which helps in producing the epidermal ridges. Uh, then we have the, the deeper region called the reticular layer, which is composed mainly of dense irregular connective tissue, which has collagen fibers that run in multiple directions. This protects our skin on many layers, so we have a lot of um, lines of stress that are being protected by these collagen fibers. So the papillary layer is composed of dense or is composed of areolar connective tissue and makes up the basement membrane, um, helps in producing the dermal papillae. I'm going to show you this right now. So here we see the dermal papillae. This is all part of that papillary region. Um, this is what produces these epidermal ridges, which produces our fingerprints. Um, within that papillary region, we have um, blood vessels. We also have nerve endings. Um, these nerve endings are going to identify different characteristics like um, deep pressure, pain, um, temperature changes, stuff like that. The reticular layer then is the deepest region and this is composed mainly of dense irregular connective tissue which um, protects us from stress. So our skin is constantly under mechanical stressors and the reticular layer protects us from those mechanical stressors. Both the papillary region and the reticular region have a really good nerve supply. These nerve fibers are going to detect changes in the environment, either um, pressure, vibration, temperature changes, and they're going to send signals as well as pain, I should say that. Um, they send signals to the um, nervous system, to the brain, and they detect, or they, the brain then determines what functions have to occur if our body starts to overheat, um, then our brain might tell our blood vessels to dilate so that blood flow can go to the surface of the skin and then tells our sweat glands to secrete sweat. That would be an example of how our um, nervous system and our integument work together. We also have an excellent blood supply. This, the um, highly vascular regions protect us, um, so they, they feed the epidermis, which is composed of avascular tissues, epithelial tissues. They also feed the dermis, um, all the structures within the dermis, such as sweat glands, hair follicles, um, and they can bring white blood cells to damaged tissue, stuff like that. Um, the blood supply also controls um, temperature to some extent uh, because if our body gets too hot or too cold, blood vessels in the integument will either vasodilate or vasoconstrict. Vasoconstriction occurs when temperature gets too um, cold and it keeps blood from flowing to the surface of the skin. Vasodilation occurs when our body temperature gets too warm and it allows blood to flow to the surface of the skin. Um, both of these are going to um, maintain body temperature, so in homeostasis. And both work under negative feedback. 
We then have the subcutaneous layer, which is actually not a part of the integumentary system, but it is still um, discussed in the integumentary system. The main functions of the subcutaneous region, so it is composed of adipose connective tissue and areolar connective tissue. Um, it's highly vascular. And one of the main functions is it provides thermal insulation, so it keeps our body warm, but it also um, protects us, or not, I won't say protects, it also attaches our integument to underlying organs. So now let's talk about the derivatives of our skin. We have nails, hair, as well as glandular tissue that we'll talk about here, okay? Um, they're formed in the dermis or they're found in the dermis, but they have um, some openings to the epidermis. First one we'll talk about are the nails. So nails are um, modifications of the stratum corneum. So they become really hard, thicker stratum corneum. Um, nails, when they're growing, um, all the nail on the outside is actually dead tissue. So all the nail that you see is dead. But they're attached to a nail bed, which is living tissue. Franklin? No. Um, and so if you ever have your nail like ripped down too low, it actually hurts because the underlying basement or not basement nail bed is um, living tissue. The only region of the nail that is actually alive is in the nail root. Um, this is the area where we're growing our nail. So we have stem cells that produce new nail. Okay. Um, and so this is, and so the function of your nails is to um, protect your, your digits, the fingers and toes, and to keep, um, to allow us to grasp things um, and tear things. But nails don't really have the same function as they did hundreds of years ago. We cover our nails, um, we wear shoes, so we have protections of our nails in the form of our shoes. We also um, don't use our nails in the same way. Um, today we don't have to tear objects apart like we did um, you know, two, three hundred years ago when um, maybe that's how we ate. We didn't have the tools to um, eat food the way we do now. So we had to tear our food apart. And because of this, nails are becoming kind of obsolete. Um, this is a figure showing an ingrown toenail. So ingrown toenails are... Um, nails that grow improperly. So they grow, instead of growing outwards, they grow into our skin. And so this is kind of a cute picture, but as cute as this cartoon is, it's very painful. When, you're, when your nail grows into the skin, it causes um, damage to the skin, it can cause infection to the skin, and so typically people will have their nails cut out. And what um, doctors do now is they tend to, when they cut the nail out, they tend to kill the nail bed, or not the nail bed, they tend to kill the um, root of the nail. And what that does is it keeps you from having to worry about um, new nails growing. And so people get their nails um, killed off so they never grow again and you don't have to worry about having um, ingrown nails again. So let's talk about hair. Hair is um, found all over the body except for where we have thick skin. 
um, hair, a single hair is called a pelus. Multiple hair are called pili. And your hair has smooth muscle associated with it. Those smooth muscles are called erector pili muscles. They make your hair stand erect. That's their function. Um, hair is composed of stratified, or not stratified, I'm sorry, keratinized cells. Um, as the hair moves away from the hair matrix, from the root of the hair, the cells die, just like our stratum corneum. They're all dead. So once they come um, through the head, the hair that we see is all dead hair, which is why it doesn't hurt to cut it, because it's dead. There are three types of hair. We have lanugo, which is the downy hair that you see on um, newborns. Typically, um, premature newborns have way more lanugo than um, your fully uh, full-term babies that are born. Um, if and this is one way they can identify the age, the the like how premature a baby is. So if you have a lot of hair on your skin, then you're probably more premature than someone who has very little hair on their, on their um, body. Bella's hair is primary hair found on the upper and lower limbs of the body. Bella's hair is that soft hair that um, people now shave off completely, typically, but um, which covers the arms and the legs and that um, as we get older, once we hit puberty, um, some of the vellus hair turns into um, terminal hair. And so we see terminal hair on our head, um, on the faces of men, eyelashes, eyebrows, um, axial and appendix, the axillary region and the um, genital region, we see the terminal hair. It's thicker hair. Erector pili muscles are what control our hair. Um, they help in producing um, the changes that you see when you have goosebumps, when you get very scared and your hair stands up on end. Um, that's the erector pili muscle doing its job. The function is to make your hair stand out so that you can stay warm. Or you can puff your body up and make yourself look scarier. And um, we don't really use it for that purpose. Um, so typically when we see goosebumps, we um, typically think cold. So here's your erector pili muscle. Here's the hair. Um, there's the hair papilla, the matrix. This is where the hair is living. As the hair leaves this region and moves outwards, it dies. It's completely keratinized and dead. So hair has multiple functions. One is, or one of the main functions is protection. So hair in our scalp protects us from the sun. Um, we have hair inside our ears, in our nostrils that protect us from um, any materials moving into our body, through our ears or through our nose. Um, we have hair surrounding our eyes that keeps materials out of our eyes. Hair prevents heat loss. So the scalp is one of the areas that has a lot of heat loss, which is why infants, when they're first born, always wear hats to keep the heat from escaping from their head. Um, hair has sensory functions uh, because we have tactile receptors associated with the hair follicles. So if one hair on your head is touched, you can feel it. Um, hair is used in visual identification, so it can tell the age of an individual. Um, if someone has pubic and axillary hair, they've already hit puberty. Um, you can tell the sex from the, um, if they have hair on their face. Um, oftentimes the way they style their hair might help you to identify the sex of an individual. Um, hair also has associated with it pheromones. 
pheromones are secretions um, associated with our sweat glands. And these secretions, typically seen in apocrine sweat glands, not in our um, normal sweat glands, secrete chemicals that help us to um, be attracted to individuals that are different from us. So um, what we don't want, we don't want to have um, our partner be identical to us because that would cause problems. So that's why um, inbreeding is so bad because um, disorders become very common when you inbreed. Our skin then has also um, different exocrine glands. Exocrine glands are glands that, that release chemicals to the surface or to the opening of a lumen. The two types that we really focus on are sweat and sebaceous glands. Sweat glands, also known as sudoriferous glands, are the glands that secrete um, sweat in the, as a response to um, increased heat to the body. Um, sweat can also be released due to stress. And then we have sebaceous glands, which are our oil glands. There are two types of sweat glands that we talk about, merocrine sweat glands and apocrine sweat glands. Both are found in the reticular layer of the dermis and both secrete to um, through a duct. But merocrine secretions, their duct opens to the surface of the skin, whereas apocrine secretions secrete to a hair follicle, into a hair follicle. Uh, merocrine secretions are the most common secretions, or merocrine glands are the most common glands. They're found all over our body and they secrete um, typical sweat composed mainly of water and some um, waste products. Electrolytes, um, some urea, stuff like that, that enters or that moves to the surface of our skin and that is then going to evaporate associated with the um, release of heat. Apocrine sweat glands then secrete directly to a hair follicle and their sweat is composed mainly of proteins, fats, and um, this is the sweat that's associated with both your pheromone release as well as with odors. So the odor is released when bacteria break down the fats and proteins. Oil glands produce oil. Um, the oil of our skin is called sebum, and so sebaceous glands. These are holocrine glands, so they basically break apart. The gland itself breaks apart and new cells form in its place. These secretions then um, also become active during puberty and they release oils to um, hair follicles. These oils protect our skin. They have um, chemicals within the oils that keep bacteria from being able to grow. They can um, especially bacteria that are anaerobic or that are aerobic won't be able to grow in the anaerobic environment of the oil. They help to lubricate hair so that hair isn't so dry and brittle. So what often happens is we take the oils from our skin and we remove them and then we put, we replace them with oils from other um, animals or plants. So I always like to show this because, you know, ostrich oil is one of those. Another type of gland that we have are ceremonious glands. Ceremonious glands secrete ceramin. Ceramin is earwax. So um, ceramin is kind of modified um, so ceremonious glands are modified apocrine sweat glands and their secretions 
are um, thick, waxy material that traps um, potential damaging agents that are trying to move towards the eardrum. So cerumen is important. We don't want to remove it all. That being said, too much cerumen can actually um, cause us not to be able to hear. And then mammary glands are also modified apocrine sweat glands um, that only function during pregnancy and um, lactation in females. And their function is to produce milk that then can be released and feed offspring. The integument, or I should say um, epithelium in a nutshell, um, responds to mechanical stress by undergoing mitosis much more readily. This thickens our skin. So think about the soles of your feet. Um, the more times you walk on your feet without shoes, the thicker your soles become. Um, have you ever played on like monkey bars? And when you were young, you'd get blisters on your, your hands, right under your fingers. And then the more you played, the thicker that area got. So you had this like thickening on your, on your hands from playing on the monkey bars. Um, that thickening um, is in response to mechanical stress. So what happens when tissue is actually damaged then? Um, two things can occur depending on the severity of the damage. Um, our integument will regenerate, and so regeneration restores full function because you replace the cells with the same exact cells, whereas if the damage is too great and you can't fix the, the tissue, then you're going to produce scar tissue, and that's called fibrosis. Scar tissue is actually a form of connective tissue um, that just basically um, fills a gap so that you don't have this big hole in your um, epidermis. But the function of that region is going to change because you don't have the same cells, so you don't have the same structure, which means that you don't have the same function. And so this is just showing um, stages of wound healing of the epidermis, the first thing that would happen um, when you have a wound, you're going to produce a blood clot, um, that scab that covers is going to allow the deeper tissues to start to heal, blood vessels start to um, come back together, and eventually you'll be able to produce new um, epithelium once you have fixed the dermal region. Again, depending on how um, deep the damage is. So wound healing is not a, an overnight process. It takes time, and that is going to be dependent on a lot of factors. So um, the, the larger the wound, the longer it takes. The um, health of the individual if you're an unhealthy person, if you're already sick, if you're elderly, um, then you're likely not going to um, have wound healing occur as rapidly. Um, one of the clinical views that we talk about is acne, because acne affects um, pretty much everyone at some point in their life. Once you hit puberty, you start forming um, acne on your skin. And um, once you um, become an adult, typically the acne that you have um, decreases if immensely to the point where you might see a pimple once a month or, you know, every couple of months. Um, what acne is, is a sebaceous gland that gets plugged up. And um, so you can see that on this child here. So here's your sebaceous gland leading right to the hair follicle. Um, when it gets plugged, 
then the sebum builds up and the sebum and white blood cells all um, form a pimple. And so the white head that you see is this white pussy material that's built up, which is composed of the oils and any trapped um, bacteria that were in there, as well as white blood cells that moved to that site. Typical treatment, um, anything that's going to dry out the skin. Um, sometimes you might take antibiotics because there are bacteria. Uh, Propriano bacterium acne is um, a species that causes acne. Uh, vitamin A can actually help in reducing acne. Um, washing your face will reduce the amount of oils on your face. Acne isn't associated with dirty skin per se. Um, obviously, if you're not washing your face, then you're going to be more likely to have um, a clogged pore. But even if you wash your face every day, twice a day, you can still get acne. Um, sebaceous cysts form deep to the surface of the skin, so they don't have that opening to the surface of the skin. And because of that, where acne, you see that white head with a sebaceous cyst, it's completely surrounded by a connective tissue covering. And this has to be removed. This capsule has to be removed so that the cyst goes away. And so typically with a sebaceous cyst, you're going to have um, the patient um, come in and they're going to cut the wound open and then um, pull the tissue out. I do have a video that I'll show you on this one. only if I think the video will play. I'm only going to watch a small portion of this just and then I'll let you guys oh, I'll let you guys watch it on your own. So this is a sebaceous cyst. They've had to cut it open and now they're they're getting rid of the um, pus. As they do this, they're going to have to use um, forceps to open the capsule. Make sure that they get all the, the pus and blood out of the capsule, and then they will pull the capsule itself out. So here they're cutting the capsule away from the body. That's good. And this is going to um, get rid of the capsule so that that pus won't build up again. <laughs> Go to here so you can see the capsule coming out slowly. Here you can see them pulling that capsule. That's part of that connective tissue wrapping that was keeping um, that cyst alive, basically, allowing that cyst to persist in the um, body. Anytime you have a cyst like this, you don't want to um, try to remove it on your own. I know you see videos all the time where people are doing that. I've seen them on Facebook and all other places. That's just crazy. You want to go to a professional and have it removed properly. You can have it videotaped and then you can post it. That's not a big deal, but you don't want to... Here we're getting it. It's even farther along. The devil made me do that. Oh, yes. <laughs> so we're 
almost getting the entire bag out. Go way up here so you can kind of go. So there, it's a large bag that was filled with this pus. Mm -hmm. oh. And that can be very painful. Um, it can be unsightly, can cause you to feel uncomfortable because you have this bump on your body in a different area of the body. Oftentimes these are found on the, on the face. So there's your sebaceous cyst. They're going through it and just checking it. Then they will um, the sebaceous sac. Go now. They're just making sure that it's completely empty, and then they will um, usually they'll um, pack it if it's large. Um, if they if they don't, if they don't need to pack it, they won't pack it. Um, that really is dependent on if the um, cyst is super large, they might want to pack it to make sure that nothing, no damage, um, no pathogens get in that area while it's healing. And then they'll fix it, you know, a week or so later, they'll come back. Oh, okay. That's weird. All right. Um, and I already talked about sebaceous glands being plugged. Okay. Um, another disorder is called psoriasis. Psoriasis is an autoimmune disorder in which your keratinocytes um, start getting attacked by your own immune system cells. And your cells are going to respond by replicating very rapidly. So what this does is it causes um, a thickening of the epidermis. Um, the cells become very thick. They don't fall off as effectively. Your um, growing skin at about twice the rate that normal skin is grown, and you're not shedding the skin properly. So it causes um, an inflammatory response in that area which causes um, pain, itching, and swelling. So there are different types of psoriasis. Um, um, typical psoriasis can be treated using um, chem uh, um, lotions like corticosteroid lotions. Um, you can get special uh, psoriasis lotions. They can use um, immunosuppressive drugs to treat psoriasis. Um, UV light therapy often treats psoriasis. So in that sense, tanning is actually beneficial. Burns are another clinical view. So we have three types of burns that we talk about. Uh, burns can be caused by anything that um, causes the body the, the skin's temperature to increase so much that you and you can't cool it off by just sweating. Um, so radiation, chemicals, sunlight can all cause burns. Um, there are three types of burns. First degree burns only involve the epidermis. And so we see this here is a first degree burn where her skin is burned, but where she has her um, swimsuit, there was no burn whatsoever. Her skin becomes red. Um, there is pain associated with it, and there's itching. Um, typical treatment would be using like aloe solutions and um, cool water just to soothe the pain. Also, vinegar solutions can actually cool the body and reduce the itching. Second degree burns include the epidermis and a part of the dermis. Um, in this case, the skin can blister in a second degree, degree burn. Um, you can have scarring and you sometimes, depending on the, the um, amount of 
tissue damage in a second degree burn, you may end up going to the hospital. So, um, and then they will give you um, special burn creams. You're going to have to keep that area covered and just protect it because it's not going to have as much protection until the burn goes away. Third degree burns are the worst type of burns. These, in these involve the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous, subcutaneous regions. Um, third degree burns always require hospitalization. They're going to first treat for dehydration, and then they're going to worry about um, infections. The reason you don't have to worry about infections initially is because the area that was burned is now sterile. There's a lot of pain associated with the third degree burn, so all burns have pain, but the actual region of the burn, of the third degree burn, it will have no pain whatsoever. This is because um, you killed all of the nerve cells associated with that region. But the pain is caused by the first and second degree burns surrounding that region. So you're going to have to debride the third degree region, and in doing so, you're going to be scrubbing the second degree and first degree areas, and that causes a lot of pain. So one of the first, or one of the um, ways that we treat burns is by using this um, estimating rule called the rule of nines, which splits our body into um, nine basic regions, and that will help us determine um, the amount of damage, so the amount of fluids and calories they need that the patient needs to be given. The last thing we'll talk about is um, skin cancer. So skin cancer is caused by, um, typically by radiation. Um, so being in the sunlight too long, using tanning beds, these um, cause your the DNA in the skin to potentially be mutated and that causes cancer. So skin cancer is one of the most common types of cancers. Um, there are three forms of skin cancer, and we'll talk about each of them. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common form of skin cancer, and it's the least dangerous form of skin cancer. So it's actually not super horrific. Um, it's, it starts in the stratum basal, which is where it gets its name, and it appears as a small elevation of the skin. This usually, um, when you notice it, you go to a doctor and the doctor will identify it as a carcinoma and will remove it. Typically, if you have it removed um, and then you keep from being in direct sunlight, um, you're going to be fine. So it's not common, it doesn't commonly metastasize or spread to other regions. Squamous cell carcinoma is also not very, um, it doesn't spread very fast at all. Um, it develops in the stratum, stratum spinosum region and it arises from the keratinocytes there. So again, treatment um, is surgical removal and then staying out of the sun um, for long periods of time. The worst form of cancer, skin cancer, is malignant melanoma. So these occur in the melanocytes of the stratum basal layer. And um, when you have melanoma, this form of cancer actually is highly metastasizable. So if you have it detected early on, then you are more likely to um, survive. They can remove the mole. So it's usually seen in moles that you have. Um, they can remove the mole and hopefully keep you from um, having cancer spread. But if you don't diagnose early on, this disease or this form of cancer is very spreadable.
as we get older, our skin is going to change. I mean, just like everything, cells, um, as we get older, we um, slow down, our cells slow down. Our cells don't produce as many fibers. They're not working as effectively. And so this causes things like our skin to lose elasticity, which leads to wrinkles. Um, our skin doesn't have the collagen fibers that it used to have, so we don't have as much protection from mechanical stress. We don't produce as much as many cells, so our skin thins out. One treatment for aging, which I don't really agree with, but I always talk about, is using Botox. So Botox is a chemical that's produced from the toxin um, that causes botulism. So the species that produces this is known as Clostridium botulinum, produces um, the botulism toxin, which can lead to flaccid paralysis. So what happens is um, with the botulinum toxin, you see here, um, this is a motor neuron releasing acetylcholine, which causes your muscles to become active and then they contract. With Botox or with botulinum toxin, um, you can't release acetylcholine. It basically stops the release of acetylcholine. And that causes your muscles to relax and that causes your wrinkles to decrease. But you have to have Botox um, injected repeatedly. All right, I'm done with this chapter. I'm going to shut this off and upload it. You guys have a great day.